Welcome to Church at Home with Perot Baptist Church. We're so glad that you're joining us online as we worship together. You know, it is a privilege that whether we're here present together on Sunday mornings or present together online, we remember that we are the people of God, taking effect and sharing his love wherever we happen to find ourselves in whichever community we are a part of. We are glad that you are worshiping with us and we pray that you would experience God's love in a very real way this week. May you be blessed.
And I'm picking up in chapter 2, beginning at verse 15. <coughs> we who are Jews by birth and not <coughs> sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. But if in seeking to be justified in Christ, we Jews find ourselves also among the sinners, doesn't that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, then I really would be a lawbreaker. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died. God bless the reading of his word this morning. Let's go back in time, shall we, to the late 80s. I was in elementary school, and a staple of the school year for me was Friday Night Kids Club. It was basically a youth group for elementary school students. And as it happened, it just happened to be held at my elementary school. And here's a story that I will never forget. That particular Friday evening, I had invited one of my friends to come with me. That's not what I want to tell you, but just so you have some background. But there was another family who needed their kids to get a ride home. So my dad in his relatively new 1987 white Dodge K car, <laughs> drove my friend, my brother, and these two bro other brothers who lived in the south end of Halifax. We lived in the north end at the time. They lived in the south end. So dad drove them home. And at one point in the ride, and I, I don't know why I remember it in such vivid detail, well, you might see in a minute why I remember it in such vivid detail. We were on Oxford Street, so we were traveling south on Oxford Street, and they lived just by Dalhousie, that these two brothers. And the older brother was telling a story, and the younger brother apparently didn't like the fact that he was cut off by his older brother. And the next thing I heard in the dark of the car was one of the loudest slaps I've ever heard in my life. The younger brother just slapped the older brother across the face. Whack! It, it, it was stunned silence. And for about five seconds, I don't think anybody said anything. The older brother was shocked. I thought my dad was going to... I don't know what he was going to do, but I was afraid. Um, it, he kept his cool, though. And the parents weren't home, so my dad had to go in and tell the babysitter what happened. And then he talked to the parents later. If you've ever seen or experienced something like that, it's kind of shocking and weird. And take any other adjective you want and put it into a blender. Needless to say, the atmosphere in the car was very strange until we dropped them off. In the first part of Galatians 2, which we didn't read, Paul gives his fellow apostle Peter a verbal slap across the face when he accused Peter of being a hypocrite. No, it didn't happen in a K car, but it was a slap nonetheless. Why did Paul do this? Because Peter, the same Peter whom God had used to open the doors to bring the good news to non-Jewish people, to Gentiles. This same Peter, who supported Paul as an apostle to the Gentiles, was now going along with those who said that Jewish Christians 
shouldn't sit at the same table with anyone who wasn't a Jew. Remember, Paul's missionary journeys mean that for the first time, the gospel is being brought in mass to non-Jews. Galatia is in modern-day Turkey. And what this means is that the leadership of the church had to wrestle with the implications of non-Jewish people accepting the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. And one of the things that they particularly had to wrestle with was... Should these converts, should these believers who aren't Jewish keep the Jewish law? Things like saying no to pork and being circumcised. And, 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 and even, and this is really important, unwritten social convention type rules like not eating with Gentiles. The conclusion of the church leadership and just read the book of Acts, is that no, Gentiles don't have to observe these things. But it seems as though, and this is, what, this is what brings us to the reason for the letter to the Galatians, it seems as that some went back on this agreement. Even Peter, even Peter went back on what was agreed upon. Even Peter went back on what God revealed to him. And in verse 15, Paul's words are dripping with sarcasm and irony as, as, as he quotes a well-known sentiment. He says, we ourselves are Jews by birth, not Gentile sinners. It's as if Paul is saying, we aren't like non-Jews who are outside the covenant and mimicking the disgust some Jews would have in their voice as they describe those who weren't part of their number, Paul says, we're not sinners. But in verse 16, Paul turns up the heat. Paul says, yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. This is so important that Paul basically says the same thing again. We have come to believe in Christ Jesus so that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by doing works of the law. When God acts, he often doesn't act the way we expect him to. And sometimes we're disappointed. But being the incredible God that he is, God sometimes blows our expectations out of the water, making what we hope for seem small. Some Jews had hoped that when God sent his Messiah, they would be freed from their brutal landlords, the Romans, and that the nation of Israel would be displayed as the crown jewel of God's creation, the example of what it means to be faithful followers of God. But when Jesus came and sent the Holy Spirit, God showed everyone that he had something different in mind. Yes, Jewish people could still be God's chosen people, but because of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, Gentiles, non-Jewish people, could now be part of God's chosen, chosen people too. And really, if you're reading the Old Testament carefully, this was part of God's plan all along. Ultimately, someone's ethnic background is not the defining issue. That's not to dismiss how God had worked through Israel and other culturally important things. But really, only one thing mattered. Whether you trusted in this Jesus, whom God raised from the dead. Because faith in Jesus is what justifies us in God's sight. Now, there's a bit of an interpretive dilemma here. I'm just going to let you in. A bit of a sidebar. We're not going to spend a lot of time on it. But in the last 40 years in particular, scholars have argued, is this faith in Jesus or the faithfulness of Jesus? The Greek is ambiguous here. And rather than getting into that debate this morning, I just want to say, yes, it's both. Not either or. It's, of course, our trust in who Jesus is and the faithfulness of Jesus. Because of the faithfulness of Jesus and our faith in the faithful Jesus, 
We are justified. Now, that sounds like a highfalutin word, and I don't like those fancy theological words, especially in a church context. But basically what it means is to be declared righteous or good. And in the context of verse 16 of our passage, it means that we will be declared righteous or good by God. Why is this important? If we are good people who do good things, why should we be concerned with whether God declares us righteous or good? Because each of us can have a skewed sense of right and wrong. Maybe you've noticed this. Even David, who's remembered as Israel's greatest king, used his power to take advantage of Bathsheba and then murder her husband to try to sweep it under the rug. That's an ugly story from the Old Testament. Yes, this is an extreme example, but if we're honest, we hurt ourselves and other people every day. And we're not sure how to stop doing it sometimes, but God does. Each of us was made in the image of God, but that God-likeness has been cracked. We're not sure how to fix it, but God does. Not one of us lives life the way it was intended to be lived all the time, but Jesus did. And the Bible teaches us that this skewed sense of right and wrong, the hurt, the brokenness, the cracked God-likeness, and our ignorance is due to something called sin. And just so I'm not accused of flinging around another highfalutin word, sin is anything that goes against God's character and his perfect, loving, and just plan for his creatures, you and me. It's in this sense that we are all sinners. Paul elaborates on this in his letter to the Romans. In the famous line, all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. Each of us has been created in God's image, but we've walked away, and in some cases run away, from our Creator. No one is sinless before God. And what Paul is saying here is that faith in Jesus and what he has done justifies us. But we have to be careful. The farthest thing from Paul's mind was this modern idea that's kind of seeped into the church. That God will declare us good in his sight because we ask Jesus into our heart and then proceed to live our lives any way we want. Taking advantage of people and then, you know, asking for God for forgiveness in kind of a flippant way afterwards. That's why I don't think it's an accident that Paul writes in verse 19 that I have been crucified with Christ. Notice that Paul doesn't say, I was crucified or I had been crucified with Christ. I, but he says, I have been crucified with Christ. In other words, it happened, but it's an ongoing experience. For you grammar nerds out there, perfect tense is used here. Paul saw himself as still on the cross with Jesus. Now, our first instinct might be that this is a morbid picture, and it kind of is, but in another way, it isn't at all. In order for us to be made more and more like Jesus, we need to let God kill off every last bit of ourselves that opposes his perfect, loving, and just plan for our lives. For Paul, being a Christian is not a, a pie-in-the-sky ordeal. It's a nitty-gritty thing. It may not always be pleasant, but as God makes us more like Jesus, we will be able to say with Paul that the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. In fact, Paul basically says, it's this, this dying to self, this being crucified with Jesus, it's so worth it that you can drum up any charge you want. If you want to call me an ignorant, non-Jewish sinner because I don't require that the Gentiles keep the law, that's fine. Water off a duck's back for Paul. I'll do you one better, Paul says. I'd be a deliberate lawbreaker if I did what you wanted me to. Verse 18 reads, If I build up again the very things I once tore down, then I demonstrate that I am a transgressor. 
More to the point, Paul doesn't put too much stock in the law, at least in the way he used to do so. Because as faithful a person as Paul was, he recognized that on his own, he couldn't fulfill all of God's righteous requirements. Paul saw that he needed not just help, as important as that is, but a new life. And this is what Jesus gave him. Jesus now lived inside of Paul, not erasing his personality, making him some kind of spiritual robot, but sustaining and molding him into the person God wanted him to be. Paul's life now is a testimony to the fact that Jesus was at work in Paul. And Jesus at work is exactly what happens when we put our faith in Jesus. I asked you to consider last week some of the ways we've seen Jesus at work in each other. Sometimes progress seems as though it's slow. I should be a little bit more personal there. When I look at my own life, I sometimes think that progress is slow. But Jesus is at work in us, giving us a new identity, different goals, changing us from the inside out, and making us more like himself. But Jesus also gave Paul a new perspective. Hanging on the cross, hanging on a Roman cross to die, was what outcasts, robbers and murderers and Basically, the dregs of society were punished with. So if Jesus, and this is important, if Jesus willingly died as an outcast, how could Paul, as one of Jesus' followers, refuse to eat with so-called outcasts? Well, Paul couldn't refuse to do such a thing, because he knew that regardless of what he used to think, and regardless of what some of his opponents still thought, he was a fellow outcast who needed Jesus as much as anyone. The only person who wasn't an outcast is Jesus himself. And Jesus died the death of an outcast for all the real outcasts for this reason. Just as he loved Paul and gave himself for Paul, and I love the, the autobiographical tone of verse 20. The, the intensely personal language that Paul uses there. The Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. And just as Jesus loved Paul and gave himself for Paul, Jesus loved you and me and gave himself for you and me. That is something to celebrate on this beautiful day summer morning. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for the love that we have in Christ. We thank you that even though we stand before you as people who have broken your law, who are selfish, and who are in desperate need of your help, that you love us, that you've shown us a better way in Jesus. And even though our actions and our attitudes mean that we could be treated as outcasts, you don't do that. And our prayer this morning is that we would not view anyone else as an outcast because God's love, your love, Jesus' love is as intense for others as it is for us and may we remember that. In Jesus' name we pray.
read the letters of the Apostle Paul in particular to go away feeling bad about ourselves. And that's not necessarily a bad thing if we're doing it in the right way. But I think it is a mistake in reading the entirety of the scriptures, and Paul in particular, if we stay there. And depending on your personality, that's a bigger temptation for some than others. We recognize that we are fallen people. We recognize the things that we do wrong. And, and we should recognize those things. But if that was the biblical story, it wouldn't be good news. It would be depressing news. And one of the wonderful things about the psalm we read this morning and in the passage from Galatians is that when we recognize our shortcoming, when we shortcomings, when we recognize our sin, we have help with that. We serve a God who is gracious. Even in the Old Testament, God Himself is described as gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. The psalm reminds us that when we bring our shortcomings to God, when we acknowledge our sin to God, He forgives us. And the rest of that psalm is a joyful response to God's grace. And that grace includes forgive, the ability to forgive others, the ability to forgive ourselves, the ability to apologize, to make things right. And as we come to the table this morning, this table of grace, as we take the bread and the cup, may we be mindful that in Christ... God's mercy and grace are extravagant. That yes, we are a needy people, a broken people, a people who hurt ourselves and others. But when we come humbly before God, when we come to the foot of the cross, there we receive grace to help us to help us to see how great God's love is for us. And if that isn't motivating, I don't know what is. The God whom we have offended loves us and is gracious to us. This morning I'd like to give us just an opportunity before I read the words of institution to quiet our hearts and to come before God, to acknowledge before him those things that we aren't proud of, and to ask him for his grace and mercy to live the way he's called us to. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And I would ask Richard to give thanks for the bread. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we are thankful for the privilege of gathering at your table today. As we look through the summer months, we pray for better growing conditions for our crops. We pray that the remainder of our growing season will yield a good crops that will provide accessible food for all people. We think of the search process our church is currently undertaking to secure a foster of preaching and congregational care. We pray this process will be blessed. As the time that Matt serves our church on an interim basis, comes to an end, we give thanks for his time with us and pray for blessings on him 
in his future endeavors. As we take the bread, remember that it represents the body of Christ that was given so that we may have the hope of eternal life. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let us eat this bread in remembrance of Christ's sacrifice for us, and may we be truly thankful. same way he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. And Greg is going to give thanks for the cup. The cup we share today is a cup of promise. Not a promise that we would not have hardships in our life on earth. The floods, forest fires, hurricanes, loss of life and property that, that have affected so many recently make it imperative that we draw on the strengths <clears throat> and the resilience that God has given us. And also the wisdom and the vision to see and enjoy the beauty of this land, the love of family, friends, and neighbors, and realize that the real promise is the eternal life when we have done our best and our work on the earth is done. Amen. The blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink with thanksgiving. Closing hymn is number 712, sent forth by God's blessing.
perhaps I should have prayed for grace to deal with those communion cups as we open them. But <laughs> just from the sounds. <laughs> now hear this benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. Amen. <laughs>